Yes, uh, so I'm delighted to have this invitation um, from the Cambridge University Library to speak on a subject that has engaged me for the better part of four decades, the illustrated woodblock printed book in early modern Japan. Uh, let me just tell you that from time to time, I'm going to be using a holder slide. So there's nothing wrong with your screen. Um, these are uh, subdued images that, that will be holding, uh, will be place markers for me. Now, <clears throat> the illustrated book is a large topic one that encompasses works of fiction, including adventure stories for boys, historical romances, edifying tales, stories of daily life in untrammeled erotica, as well as poetry anthologies, school textbooks, gazetteers and guidebooks, encyclopedias, self-help manuals, specialist handbooks, including medical texts and cookbooks, calligraphy and letter writing manuals, design manuals for the use of craftsmen and copy books for aspiring artists. Today, I will limit myself to the final category, copy books intended for aspiring artists. The Union Catalog of Pre-Modern Japanese Books lists well over 600 titles within this category. They are the fruits of the commercialization and popularization of the practice of art in Japan in the course of the 18th century. By art, I mean brush painting. This vogue was inspired by the example of the Chinese literati who included brush painting and calligraphy among their amateur accomplishments. These Japanese books, inspired by imported Chinese manuals, embody the creative interplay of art and commerce. I will not attempt a superficial survey of this sizable corpus. Instead, I will focus on two contemporaneous but very distinct titles published early in the 19th century. I will not present a selection of images from those volumes. To cherry pick would distort the impact of these books. It would deny their nature and structure. The images in each were carefully chosen and ordered by the artist. Each is a unitary work of art that reflects its creator's distinct artistic personality. Each is a three-dimensional interactive tool for learning and for pleasure. I will take you through both books from cover to cover. In the preceding lecture in this series, Professor Peter Konitsky presented an eloquent account of the development of printing and book production in Japan. For those of you who missed that lecture, I will provide a brief overview of the history of printing in Japan before moving on to my subject. <clears throat> printing from, what, from cut woodblocks had been introduced from China by proselytizing Buddhist monks. The earliest surviving dated book production in Japan, a Buddhist sutra, was printed from cut woodblocks in 1009. In the six centuries that followed, printing remained a monastic enterprise. The monastic presses only printed Chinese language texts. Japanese language texts were transmitted in manuscript through those centuries. Movable type arrived late in Japan in the final decade of the 16th century from two sources, Europe via the Jesuit missionaries and Korea as the spoils of war. Commercial publishing did not emerge in Japan until the opening decades of the 17th century, far later than it had done in China or Europe. Initially, the newly established commercial publishers made considerable use of movable type, but by the 1640s, the industry had decisively rejected movable type in favor of printing from cut woodblocks. Some European students of the book have decried this decision as a sad example of technological lock-in, a mindset that blocks the adoption of an obviously superior technology. Well, it was no such thing. The abandonment of movable type was a sound business decision, which was de dictated by the nature of written Japanese. To explain, written Japanese combines Chinese characters, which are ideograms, with syllabic scripts. The syllabic scripts are easily learned. Learning Chinese characters requires much more time and effort. In addition, when used to express Japanese, the pronunciation of individual Chinese characters differs according to context. Broadly speaking, this is not the case with Chinese. As a result, as Dr. Laura Moretti explains in her recent book, Pleasure for Profit, popular prose in 17th century Japan, in the early modern period, there was a wide range of literacies. Publishers understood <clears throat> that in order to maximize potential markets for their books, and of course, maximize their profits, they needed to gloss many, if not all the Chinese characters that appeared in the texts that they put into print. Now they achieved this by placing reduced size syllabics alongside the characters that needed glossing. 
as you can see in this excerpt from the preceding page. This is the very first line that I've parsed for you. So as you can see, um, the um, Chinese characters have not been tinted. The syllabics that are combined with the Chinese characters to write the Japanese uh, are in green. And then to the right, we have a column of syllabics alongside the Chinese characters to indicate their pronunciation in that particular context. Now, these side characters, these glosses are called furigana. To print furigana in a running text using movable type posed enormous technical challenges. It was far simpler and more economic to print these complex texts from cut wood blocks since anything that can be written or drawn on a sheet of paper can be cut into a block of wood and printed. The acknowledged need to provide furigana was the critical factor in the universal adoption of woodblock printing by the commercial publishers. That pragmatic decision made in pursuit of the widest possible audience in turn had a profound impact on the quality of the illustrations that appeared in Japanese books. Here's a detail of a woodblock printed Japanese literary text as you can see from 1685. And I have provided a centimeter uh, ruler on the top right corner. The sinuousness of the scripts employed placed great demand on the block cutters. A block cutter who could cut such texts could cut anything into printing blocks. As we see from these details, sorry, there are the furigana highlighted in pink for you. But if a block cutter could cut a text like this, then he could cut just about anything. As you can see from these snippets from a wide range of illustrated books that I've brought together here. The technology also allowed for the free flowing integration of text and image on the printed page. Since both, since both were printed using the same technology but this is a subject I do not have time to explore with you today. Now, let us turn to artist manuals or copy books in which we encounter the lively intersection of art and commerce. These books offered the users sequences of images created by artists expressly for replication in woodblock printed books. They are original works of art issued in multiples. The images in them are presented are presented independent of any text, whether narrative or didactic. These books do not reproduce pre-existing works. They reproduce with great fidelity an artist's personal style. The few texts in them are confirmed, confined to laudatory prefaces presented in an eccentric or elegant calligraphic hand. And occasionally there are very brief captions within the image fields. In a highly competitive market for books, publishers assiduously, and sometimes ruthlessly and even dishonestly promoted their publications. Their blurbs assured potential buyers that if they purchased a particular title, they could learn to paint in a fine style without the expense of paying a teacher. However, as attested by the many copies that survive in pristine condition, many purchasers had no utilitarian intent in mind. They bought and appreciated these books for their images. The way these books work becomes evident when we compare artists' paintings with the images they produced for reproduction in copy books. I have chosen uh, paintings by three artists who created notable copy books. The first is a painting by Kawamura Bumpo and it, of two cranes wading in a stream. And here we see the way Bumpo presents the same scene in Bumpo Gafu an album of Bumpo's images, paintings. Uh, the hanging scroll format was not a convenient one for reproduction in books. Uh, you would have had to reduce the images uh, greatly. So what the artist did was to reformat uh, the elements of a hanging scroll painting so that it would fit into the more confined space of the double page spread in the book. Here we have, um, so there we can see more closely, um, how effectively the printed image replicates essential features of Bumpo's brushwork. And then we'll move on now to a painting by Cho Gesho. And he produced a notable uh, uh, picture album called Fuke Gasso. And we can see here the peony and the bird itself. 
And finally, I'll conclude with a fine landscape painted on silk this time by Yamaguchi Soken and a comparable landscape in his uh, book of landscape designs. Mount Fuji is missing from the book because these landscapes are all supposed to be Chinese. Uh, however, as you can see, the essential elements of the uh, painting appear in the landscape. Now let us turn to the two near contemporaneous copy books I promised you. Bumpo Gafu, Bumpo's album of paintings, <clears throat> was published in Kyoto in 1807 by Yoshida Shinbei. Yoshida Shinbei was a major figure in the cultural life of that city, as well as a leading publisher of learned books. And the second book we're going to look at is Hokusai's Hokusai Manga, Hokusai Sketches. This was published in Nagoya in 1814 by Eirakuya Toshiro, an enterprising local publisher with grand aspirations. Bumbo was well known and much admired in Kyoto, his home city, but he was also known in Edo, that's present day Tokyo, where we find his influence in the works of print artists of the Ukiyo-e school. Bumbo enjoyed a fruitful relationship with Yoshida Shinbei that spanned two decades. In all, Bumbo published eight copybooks. Hokusai, who lived in Edo, enjoyed a national reputation. Before 1814, most of his work in book format consisted of illustrations for novels and for poetry anthologies. Hokusai Manga was his first significant foray into the market for copy books. Subsequently, through the last 40 years of his long creative life, copy books and didactic books of every kind dominated his output. In all, he was responsible for nearly 50 such titles. The Nagoya-based publisher Edakuya Toshiro played a central role in the production and dissemination of Hokusai's books during Hokusai's lifetime and for decades after his death in 1849. <clears throat> now, from the mid-18th century, publishers actively promoted artists and exploited their resultant celebrity. Both Yoshida Shinbei and Edakuya Toshiro expected that the inclusion of the artists' names in the book titles would help to sell books. <clears throat> Bumpo Gafu was devoted to uh, Bumpo's interpretation of Chinese literary subjects under three broad headings. Human figures, which I tinted in, in a, a pale yellow, where that is figures restricted to gentlemen scholars, the boy attendants and contented peasants, woodmen and fishermen. They're all presented in Chinese dress. The second category, which you see in uh, pink uh, is landscapes. And then the third category is a bird and flower pictures. Now, what Bumpo did was to present this sequence of figure, landscape, bird and flower 10 times in his book. We get 10 uh, uh, images in each category in this alteration. You have to read this uh, overview of the whole book from right to left, top to bottom. Now, <clears throat> here we come to the, the book itself. As we progress through the copy of Bumpo Gafu, I have chosen to share with you, you will notice occasional patches of light printing and the occasional fouling of broad unprinted areas. The former indicate that this was a very early printing of the book. The blocks had not yet settled down to absorb the ink evenly. And the latter, the fouling, revealed places where the wood had not been cut away to a sufficient depth. The publisher had no reservations about offering this less than perfect volume for sale. Its flaws do not detract from its function as a manual for the aspiring artist. Now, Bumbo Gafu begins with a laudatory introduction written in Chinese without any reading aids. The author praises Bumbo's total commitment to painting, the spontaneity and strength of his brush, his unerring ability to grasp the essence of things. And then a two character frontispiece, um, which you see on the left here, reads delights and it's the second half of a Chinese four character phrase, the delights of the study. It confirms Bumpo's commitment to the way of the gentleman scholar. After these preliminaries, we move on to the sequence of images. And we begin with a, a Taoist sage, God of longevity with a deer, and then the first of the landscapes. and then orchids. And here we have a Tang Dynasty official, Wei Yuan Zhong, with a boy attendant. 
The iconographies of these Chinese figures was well established and nearly all of them can be positively identified in Bumbo's books and paintings. Here we have uh, a, a Chinese literati ideal. You're out with a, a close friend, you're drinking and you're admiring a landscape. And then bamboo, another subject that was uh, to be mastered by a, a, a scholarly artist, amateur artist. And then here we have a uh, Taoist immortal um, <clears throat> riding uh, an ox, it's Lao Tzu, the great Taoist philosopher. On the left here, you can see where the block has not yet settled down, taking the ink properly. And here again, we have problems. It would have been the same block that printed the forepart of the ox and the building on the right here. And there is a problem there with the inking and the function of the block. And then we have plum blossoms another worthy subject for a literatus to paint. And here we can see a comparison of an actual painting, a fan painting, a decorative fan painting by Bumbo and the image in the book. And you can see how effective these books are in replicating the style of the artist. And then here we have a, a Confucian scholar admiring an orchid. And once again, we can compare this with a figure from the painted hand scroll. And the interesting thing is that both figures are approximately the same size. As I say, the images are to scale. Uh, many of his landscapes seem odd to us in that, in that kind of category, but this is fundamentally a landscape with the fishermen um, at work. And then a sign of spring, pussy willow and a sparrow. And here we have the God of Longevity and the long haired uh, turtle, which is another uh, symbol of longevity. And a vine leaf with grapes. And then we have Wang Wei, poet, musician, painter, and politician of the Tang Dynasty. There's a bad bit of fouling, as you can see above his head here. And then uh, um, a landscape that is very typical of Bumbo, the kind of thicket that you see here often appears in his paintings. And those huts or those houses are very much like the houses you see in his paintings. And then here we have, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> didn't want to skip. The... And then we come to a uh, woodsman uh, bringing kindling up from down from the hills and a fisherman. Here we have a woman, but she's a very subsidiary figure in the, um, the composition. Women do not figure significantly in uh, paintings of the school to which Bumbo belonged. Here's a monkey trainer, the young boys following him with a copper coin. Uh, wanting to see them perform. I don't like that footpath there, a peasant returning to his village in the snow. Finally, the crane, which we've already seen. And this is Dongfang Shuo, uh, uh, an official of the Han Dynasty, who also had a mythic life, and it was said that he stole the peaches of immortality, and we see him clutching the peaches here and then a person trudging home on an emaciated horse, again in snow. Wang Ren with his tiger. A scene by the sea. And then the final image in the book. Now, the book ends with a, a colophon, which provides us with the date, a facsimile of the artist's signature and seal. Then we have this very interesting announcement that tells us that this, this gospel uh, will run to 10 volumes and we're going to publish them sequentially and two will be forthcoming soon. Then we have the uh, names of the publisher distributors. 
One of them is based in Osaka and the other is in Kyoto. This is Yoshida Shimbe. He is the actual uh, block owner of the book, the copyright holder, if, if you will, of the book. And this is a list of works available from Yoshida Yashimbe. And if we um, look here, we actually see Bumbo Gafu itself being advertised. And uh, the brief uh, blur praises it as a model, marvelous copybook, perfect for enthusiastic beginners in the study of the art of painting, figures, flowers and birds, and landscapes. The blurb only records the first volume as available, a further indication that this is an early copy. Yoshida Shimbe amended uh, the, um, uh, the, the blocks printing this catalog in 1811 to include mention of the second volume, and again in 1813 to note the publication of the third volume, as you can see here. Um, the, they plugged the printing block uh, with another piece of, with a piece of wood and then cut the necessary uh, characters into it to indicate now that three volumes of Bumbogaf were available. Well, although 10 volumes were promised in volume one, volume two, and volume three, the series stopped with volume three. Subsequently, Yoshida Shinbe published other works by Bumpo, but he did not consider Bumpo Gafu to be profitable enough for him to continue with it. Nonetheless, the three published volumes remained in print at the very end of the 19th century. Uh, this is the second page of the list of publications. And I just want to point out that the last uh, book here is an annual poetry anthology. Uh, that Yoshida Shinbe edited himself because he was a notable poet. And for a fee, you could have your poems included in one of these books. There doesn't seem to have been any editorial oversight. You paid your money and you got uh, published. So this is another way in which uh, art or the practice of art, the practice of poetry was being commercialized by publishers in early modern Japan. Now, my second example is the first volume of Hokusai manga. It was first published in 1814. Now, <clears throat> the copy that I'm going to show you um, is a good crisp printing of 1850, some 35 years after the first appearance of this book. And this is testament to the enduring popularity of Hokusai manga. In this volume, Hokusai offers encyclopedic coverage of people from all stations in society and all occupations, as well as all living things and key elements in the construction of a landscape. So here's an overview of the content of Hokusai manga. Mankind, mammals, birds, creepy crawlies, plants, sea creatures, and then landscapes. So let's have a look through. It begins with a preface um, that tells us how marvelous Hokusai is, um, how much life there is in his art. Um, and it begins with an auspicious uh, image of a couple. This stands for conjugal felicity. Um, and then we go. First, we start with mostly Chinese figures. And here we have captions added, but captions are rather rare in the manga series. And um, more Chinese uh, figures from history and from legend. And then we have monks, including Zen monks. But here now on the right, we begin this wonderful view of the occupations of Japan, the daily life in Japan. Uh, so on the right hand side, we have things related to water, to the sea. We have the women at the top are actually divers for abalone. The two boys are playing on an anchor by the seashore and so forth. On the left hand side, I like the top left corner where we see two block cutters as it were, cutting blocks just like those that were used to print the Hokusai uh, manga. The master craftsman is cutting the fine detail here while his assistant is cutting away the broad areas uh, that were not to print. And then we go on. It's like just snapshots of things happening in the city of different occupations. In the last part of my lecture, I'll be talking about how images like this were assembled. On the right, we have courtly figures. On the left, we have ghost stories, as you see in the middle. Here we have um, a, a monk and uh, the faithful are holding a huge rosary, uh, saying prayers together to sumo wrestlers. Here's the legend of the, of the uh, teapot that turned into a badger. As I say, snapshots. 
here's the women's bath, the bottom half of the right side. And the bathkeeper, he's seen it all. He's totally engrossed in the book that he's reading. And then we come to the end of the human uh, figures and the introduction of animals. But um, I wanted to just hone in on this. There's so much detail in here. And uh, the impact of images like this in Paris in the 1860s and 70s was enormous. These books were very well known there. And then we come into the world of animals. And then the creepy crawlies. There's no distinction made between amphibians, insects, reptiles. And then the world of plants. Fish, well, creatures of the sea, because we have squid, we have fish, we have um, turtles, crustaceans, mollusks. And then we come into the final section of the first volume of manga, which is an introduction to landscapes, the variety of landscapes. And so every kind of mountain here, and then different types of surface of the sea with boats, a selection of plants. And these are very much like the imported Chinese painting manuals, these pages. So you're shown how you can assemble these things. You're given the elements that you could then assemble into a landscape yourself. A variety of villages. And then running water. On the inside back cover of this late printing, we have an advertisement uh, for a publication for a, a full color map. And then here we have the publisher distributor and it's Edaku Yatoshira who's based in Nagoya, but he also lists the address of his uh, distribution uh, place in Edo, the capital, uh, the Shogun's capital. Now, <clears throat> um, this modest volume, uh, proved an unexpected success, an enormous success. And within a year, Eiraku Yatoshira joined with a major publishing house in Edo to turn this standalone volume into the first of 10 manga volumes. Here's how it went. We started with this one volume in 1814, and then it was announced that there would be 10 following. So the first volume was reissued as not complete, but as only the first part. In the same year, parts two and three, were issued in the following year, four and five, and amazingly in 1817, six, seven, eight, and nine, and finally part 10 in 1819. Then after about a decade, the publishers announced another 10 to come. Uh, and 11, it was, as you see, in 1830, and then in 1834, part 12. But then there was a hiatus, and the next manga was published posthumously in uh, circa 1850 from designs that had been left by Hokusai. Um, 14 is a bit further from Hokusai, but yeah. And then the first Hokusai manga were exported for sale in Europe as early as 1856. And then in 1878, uh, volume 15 was issued, a pastiche derived for the most part from a Hokusai book first published in 1819. So the manga have a long publishing history. They were profitable. And Edaku Yatoshiro was energetically marketing Hokusai's books, first to a domestic audience and then to an international audience. And it was Edakuya who played a major role in promoting Hokusai's art in book form. Now, art books uh, more widely, not just Hokusai's art books, represented a profitable line of business for publishers. And as we have seen, Publishers promoted individual artists marketing their books to amateur practitioners as well as non-practicing art lovers. Now, the first 10 parts of Hokusai manga appeared in a decade of enormous productivity on Hokusai's part. The same year saw the publication of 14 other titles, which I list on the right here, some of which are of greater weight and importance than the Hokusai manga volumes. I would like to conclude this evening with a few words about how Hokusai managed to create this large corpus of books. Hokusai made use of people, pupil co-editors, whom he identifies by name in the colophons of the first 11 volumes of Hokusai manga, and also five of the other books of the 1810s. 
And I've marked all of them here with a yellow asterisk, his pupil co-editors. We know from surviving correspondence and the testimony of contemporaries that Hoksai was an inveterate sketcher. His brush was never still. When commissioned to produce a book, in many instances, he handed reams of sketches over to his most accomplished students for editing and laying out. Evidence of what the pupil co-editors did with these drawings, what they contributed to the books, is suggested by an album that contains 38 preparatory drawings for Isai Gashiki, Isai's drawing method, a book published in 1864. The artist, Katsushika Isai, was Hokusai's last pupil. This album of preparative drawings had been in the collection of the distinguished French jeweler and uh, collector Henri Vevey. It only came to wider notice less than a year ago when it appeared in an auction in Geneva. It is now in the British Museum and may be viewed in its entirety through the British Museum website. Simply enter Isai into the collection search field and the album will be the first result. The preparatory drawings in this album are for images in the two published volumes of Isai Gashiki and for designs intended for the never published third and fourth volumes of that work. As a group, these drawings reveal a great deal about the process by which books of illustrations were prepared, a process employed by Hoksai himself. I begin with a spread of flowers in Isai Gashiki. This is the printed image. The preparatory drawing for this is in the album. There we are. It is a finely finished piece of work. However, look at this backlit photograph of it, and it reveals that it was composed of numerous drawings cut from various sheets of paper and carefully arranged on the backing sheet. Once the final layout was decided, the individual drawings were pasted onto the backing sheet and identifying captions were added. The artist then placed a thin sheet of paper over this composite drawing and carefully redrew the composition, adding refinements as he did so to produce the block ready drawing. The completed block ready drawing was handed to the block cutter who pasted it face down onto a block of prepared cherry wood and cut away the wood on either side of the artist's lines. Comparing this preparatory drawing and its printed image, we find that little was added to the block ready drawing beyond the parts of leaves that were to be printed in black. And we can look closely here. In the block ready drawing, but not the preparatory drawing, the artist indicated these areas with a gray wash through which his lines were visible. In these areas, the block cutter did not cut around the lines. He cut the lines into the block and left the surrounding area of wood untouched so that the area would print in black with the vein showing in white, as you see on the left. Notice also the way in which the block cutter captured the very edges of those dark leaves. And here is another composition, uh, uh, I'm sorry, here's another comparison of a detail from another one of the East Side's preparatory drawings on the right with the same detail as printed. Uh, this is the back view of a next again. <clears throat> It is immediately apparent just how much the artist added to the block ready drawing. In the preparatory drawing, the fur of the tiger is indicated using relatively coarse perfunctory lines. The printed image reveals the great care that went into the rendering of the fleur fur in the block ready drawing and the care with which the uh, block cutter realized those lines on the printing block. The block ready drawings were created by the artist expressly for reproduction through printing. In Japanese printmaking, the block cutter does not interpret or translate or adapt an image created in another medium. The block cutter follows the lines of the block ready drawings as closely as humanly possible when cutting the printing block. His goal is to capture the artist's brushwork on the surface of the printing block. The image printed is in essence, a facsimile of the block ready drawing. I will offer one more comparison of uh, an Isai preparatory drawing with the printed image, the right half of this action pack double prayed spread in Isai Gashiki. <clears throat> I could devote half a lecture to this one drawing. Here it is not the elaboration of patterns and textures that is most striking, but rather the meticulous clarification and refinement of important elements of the composition. So here I'm just comparing the right hand half of that composition. We have the preparatory drawing on the right, the printed image on the left. 
And if you look here now <clears throat> in circle A, the uh, bit of hillside to the right of the warrior is rather empty. Uh, the artist has filled it with uh, a, 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 a line here and some vegetation. In uh, circle B on the right, he's indicated the, the um, flow of, of water in that stream with parallel lines. There isn't much life to them. They have much more animation in the printed version. And that's what the artist would have added when he was creating the block ready drawing. In the bottom right corner, we see that he rethought the uh, configuration of the hillside in the foreground there. If we go to E next, uh, we can see that it wasn't always elaborating further the design, but there are cases where he was simplifying the design on the block ready drawing, which is quite evident in this part of the armor compared to here. But of course he filled in the design on the grid pattern that he had on the preliminary drawing. But of all these changes, perhaps the most significant was the clarification of the face of the foe whose head is under the foot of this victorious warrior. Just a few small adjustments to the way the hair is falling over the face, the size of the eyes, make that face much more prominent in the final printed image. Sorry. Isai does not name any pupil co-editors in his book. He was far less productive than Hoksai had been. It is therefore likely that he worked alone on this book. Hoksai would have charged his pupil co-editors with arranging his individual drawings to create pleasing multi-figure layouts. However, Hoksai would have approved the layout and produced uh, the block ready drawing himself. I conclude this evening with a block ready drawing from the brush of Hoksai himself. <clears throat> This comes from a group of 103 block ready drawings for a book by Hoksai that never went into production. This collection of drawings had also been in the collection of Henri Veve. It was offered for, uh, at auction in uh, Paris uh, about two and a half years ago. And I'm happy to say that it is also uh, now in the collection of the British Museum. Uh, it is available um, through the museum database all of the drawings had been on display in the museum until quite recently. And there's an excellent publication uh, of all of the drawings by Tim Clark. Uh, I recommend that very much to you if you want to pursue uh, this topic further. <clears throat> now, the this of course is a proper block ready drawing. And had this book gone into production, it would have been destroyed in the process of creating the printing blocks. We have it. Now, at about the same time that Hoxai was producing these block ready drawings, he produced block ready drawings for another book that was printed. And here is a page from that book with ducks in it. And we can here see how close these are. And I think by comparing this printed image from Ehon Sai Shikitsu, with the Banmonso uh, Ehon Daizen, Daizen on the left, sorry. Uh, we can appreciate the extraordinary skill of block cutters in realizing the artist's intentions uh, in the printing block and also the skill with which the printers uh, printed from those blocks. Um, it's quite, wonderful that we can make this comparison. Um, so here we see uh, book illustration at its absolute finest. Now, further evidence of the creative interplay of art and commerce in book publishing in early modern Japan will be found in the illustrated fiction of the period, um, in um, stunning illustrated poetry, anthologies, and much else. And here's just a, a, a random selection of images from poetry, anthologies, novels, and the like. And then, of course, there are the splendors of multicolored book illustrations. But I fear these will have to wait for another occasion. Thank you very much. And I would also just like to note that all of the images that I use in this lecture, except those of the paintings, were downloaded from the book image database that was created and maintained by the Art Research Center at Itsumekan University in Kyoto. Um, thank you very much, Alice. That was uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, 
I was I thought of some amazing uh, points there and stuff that I didn't know. Um, I, yeah, it was absolutely incredible, really. Um, uh, if anyone's got any questions, um, uh, I've written down a lot on a bit of paper here, which I'm going to ask if no one else asked them. Um, but if anyone's got any questions, please do put them in the Q&A. I see that there's one in there already. Um, so we have a question. Um, were all the plants, animals, etc., cetera, um, ones from Japan? Um, and I think that was, you were showing an image, I think it was in, I think it was in Hokusai Manga, you showed an image of, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, uh, no, the, 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 the um, uh, many of the animals were from abroad. They were exotica. Uh, they had never been seen by the artist or uh, only one elephant, let's say, had come to Japan and then died uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but that didn't stop them from uh, copying images and recopying them. Uh, tigers are a case in point where they become these very floppy looking kinds of things. Um, but the thing about Hokusai was that he could, uh, even things that he had never seen, he could draw in a way that was very convincing. And one of the remarkable things about the 103 uh, uh, block ready drawings in the British Museum is, that on the same sheet, he can present a mythic creature and a, a, a real creature, and they are both equally compelling. Um, so uh, it's a mix. Yeah. I, I think the, um, we've got some more questions. I thought that you we, we have a copy of uh, the University Library's copy of Hokusai Manga is in the exhibition. Um, yes. And uh, it is, it, his, his characterization is just astonishing. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Yes. It really is. And I, I think that came across completely in the in the slides you were showing. And um, we have another question. Sorry, I, I'll, I'll stop raving about this. What is the reason for the border around the prints in the books? Um, we, sh we shouldn't call them prints per se. Uh, I mean, there, there are illustrations in the book. And uh, the, these are the margins. These are the, the, they are always framed. They don't go free flow across the page. And one of the interesting things in Japanese books is that the upper margin is always much larger than the lower margin. But you have a very small margin on the outer end of the double page opening. And the book's images never bleed across the central the well. They are always uh, within two discrete uh, frames. Uh, but if you work with these books, you eventually just visually cancel out the gap when you're looking at the images in them. But it was the convention that you can find the image within a frame. But then the fun is when an artist breaks the frame. And very often Hoxai would do that. You might see a lance that penetrates the top of the frame. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, image in another book of, of two young girls who are playing Battledore. And one of them has hit the cock so hard that it's actually gone out of the picture frame and it's in the top margin. <laughs> so it was a convention, it was there, but they could also play with it. Yeah. Publishers you named, did they use papers from specific paper makers or paper maker centers? The, the uh, uh, paper industry was enormous in, in Edo. And there were uh, categories, I, it wasn't named paper makers per se, but it would be categories of paper that you would use. The single most important component of the book was the paper. And uh, you find a publisher's lists that tell you, well, you can have this book on superior grade, middle grade or lower grade paper. You could, you could choose the grade of paper and pay accordingly. But this is not so different from what was going on in, in England, let's say in the 19th century, where you could buy books on different grades of paper. Uh, but the paper is very important and you can see if a publisher is trying to save money, um, he, he cuts down his margins uh, and he uses a, an inferior grade of paper. That makes sense. Um, uh... Is the book that you mentioned, Timothy Clark, Hokusai, the great picture book of everything, published September 2021? Uh, that's the one, yes. That's there we are. Uh, um, uh, could you specify who was the audience of such manuals as Hokusai's manga? Was it not only artists? Was it artists? Who, who was the audience? Well, I, I, I was going to say in the lecture, but I, 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 I struck it out, but I might as well say it. Now, I think some of the buyers were like people who buy these uh, luxurious cookery books. Who, who never cook a, use a single recipe in them, but admire the, the wonderful photographs. Uh, so there were a lot of people who bought them not to use them as, as, as drawing manuals. But the interesting thing is that the publishers persisted in advertising them as, man, as drawing manuals. And all you have to do is copy these. And I have seen um, in trade in Japan and in some collections, meticulous copies of entire manga volumes. 
as the kind of way, I suppose, of, you know, I'm going to learn what this guy does, so I'm going to copy everything he's got in this volume. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things I've written down, which I've got to ask, uh, uh, is, is, did, is the kind of, was there a market as well for Hokusai paintings, or, or was the fame of the man through the, the books, if that makes no, sense? No, 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 there was, there was also, there was a market for paintings, and I mean, you know, the, 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 the real thing was was the paintings, and and I remember many many years ago, uh, when I was first discovering Kawamura Bumpo's books, um, Timothy Clark reminded me. He said, "You know that this guy's real fame was based on his paintings," and of course, with further study, I realized that he was a prolific painter, and that the books reflect what his paintings did, uh, and it's the same with Hokusai. But the paintings cost a lot of money, and Hokusai felt, especially toward the end of his life, a commitment to, to pass on his knowledge. So that very last image, the very last comparison I gave you of the ducks, right? The book on the right uh, was his very last publication. And he wanted in it to, to, to record everything that he knew about the art of painting. And the format was smaller, so it would be less expensive. There, was no, there were no tints in it. And he combined text and image on each page to cut down on the number of pages in the book so it would be affordable. Right. He was writing for a public there that he expected to take up a brush and attempt to draw. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we've got some more questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, the last examples of block-ready drawings, were they composed to include the separated composition of the two-page spread? The drawing seems to be one large composition. Ah, the, the last one that I showed you. Um, has been cut out of its frame and mounted on a piece of card. It should have been, uh, uh, there should have been a companion, but in that format book, the images did not run over the double page spread. Uh, each, each page was, was complete in itself. Um, we've got a question here, which I, I'll read out, and maybe Catherine might need to provide a bit more context, but what is the relationship between prints and illustrations in books? Printed illustration. Uh, well, I, I, I don't like to consider these images that I've been showing you as prints. They're printed, but they are illustrations in book format. They're, they're illustrations within a book, within the context of a book. Um, it, in, uh, in the late 19th century, when these things were being first published in the West, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a series of very, very expensive magazine that came out devoted to Japanese art. And they used to take images from these Japanese books and put the two halves together, remove the margins, remove the center, central well, and call them a print. But they are not, they are, they are book illustrations. So we, I, I feel it's important that we keep the distinction between a proper standalone single sheet print and illustrations in a book. I think that, that highlights one of the points which we have in all exhibitions, including the um, the, the the samurai exhibition that's on at the moment, which was uh, curated in house by uh, uh, our Japanese um, keeper, uh, Kristen Williams. And, and one of the things that um, kind of comes up with that exhibition is the fact that you know we are a library, we have books that, and the, the exhibition is full of books. And indeed, in this exhibition, we have scrolls and that. But and the the book is the whole thing is an entirety. But with the the nature of exhibitions, you can only show one page, so it kind of becomes something else, which is yes, a slight yes, frustration. Yes. For it will always be a frustration with my work, and and you know, kind of have had that conversation with Kristen as we kind of as she was curating the exhibition we were putting on is, and it's the point that you know you showing every single page demonstrates this is a whole thing. It was meant to be a whole thing, thing and maybe that exactly. that's talks exactly. to that as well. Well, can I just say when I see books in a, in a display case like that in a museum, they remind me of butterflies that have been pinned onto a vacuum board. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a fair point um we have a question um uh, what differentiates a, pu a pupil co-editor from a pupil working in the studio of Hokusai well uh, the whole uh, function of the pupil co-editors is, is 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 still not entirely clear to us um but the, I think the distinction is that Hokusai felt that their contribution should be noted in the back matter of his book yeah yeah that makes sense that's, that's... Um, were all the drawings uh, and paintings done by brush or was reed pen or quill used? Uh, no, it was entirely by brush, but there was an enormous range of brushes. Um, I've 
uh, I've seen in, in a book from 1804 on how to paint, uh, they have four pages devoted to 17 different kinds of brushes that were available to you. <laughs> but the, make... the, the support was either paper or silk. Okay. Yeah. Did artists make their own brushes or was there a kind of market for... No, you, yeah, there would have been a market to buy the yeah. brushes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, uh, did Hokusai agree to have his manga to be published even after his death or was it done? Uh... Uh, now we are touching upon a very interesting subject because... I have a suspicion that uh, Hokusai fell out with Edaku Yatoshiro, that Edaku Yatoshiro controlled the blocks for a significant number of Hokusai books, but did not publish, republish them until after the artist's death. So, uh, you know, he, he once he's paid for his drawings, huh? yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Copyright then resides in owning the blocks. Yeah. The person is following the question saying who, who owns the right for publication. So presumably that is that answers that it's whoever owns who owns the, the blocks has the right for the right uh, publication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I say when they when they when they instituted uh, Western style uh, uh, copyright in the 1870s, a lot of publishers rushed to copyright their woodblock printed books, the images, so that somebody else wouldn't come and just take the images and reproduce them. Um, okay, that's yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there's a comment saying great images, not a tassie one to be seen. Um, uh, we have a, another question here saying um, for amateur artists, were there lessons or even or events for artists that uses these books? So with, could you go to painting classes? I think is that question. I, you, you could go to a, to a painting master. Yeah. Uh, there were also though uh, at parties, you know, you could go, uh, an artist would announce that he was having a party and you would pay a certain fee to go and you could take paper with you and the artist would paint something for you. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, uh, sounds like a future event. Um, and then we've got a question saying, as an illustration student, I noticed how some characters were portrayed across the well of the, of the gutter of the book, something that we are not allowed to do. Um, what would be yes. the reason for doing this? Um, but one of the interesting things about a Japanese book is that when you hold it, it's, it's a beautifully a soft book in a way. It, it's very flexible. Every part of it is made of paper. So you can hold it by the spine and you can actually press the two halves closer together to diminish the well. But the convention was that you did not bleed into the well. Right? And as I said earlier, you, you, your eye gets used to negating it, just blocking out the presence of the well. Um, and I find it quite interesting to see the way the figures are cut, that the dynamism of the design is not broken by the well uh, there. Um, that's all I could say, it was, it was the conventions, but I think they work very beautifully around that particular convention. Yes, that makes sense, that makes sense. Um, uh, we, that, that's all the questions. We've just got a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to ask one, which is, is uh, it saves me emailing you later, Alice, to ask it, frankly. Right, um, <laughs> one of the things I was interested in was, um, is the block cutters themselves. I thought the explanation of how the block cutting process worked that you gave there at the end answered quite a lot of the questions I'd written down. Um, presumably, we don't know as much about the block cutters as we do about the artists, or... Um, do we... No, unfortunately, we don't. Okay. Um, and it's quite uh, quite significant when a block cutter is actually named in a book. Okay. And uh, we're trying to gather information about block cutters. There was one block cutter, for example, that Hokusai wanted above all others to cut the blocks for his books, and he insisted that publishers engage him. And um, there's a, a there was one uh, one book that Hokusai had illustrated uh, Chinese poetry, uh, and he'd done these illustrations. And we have a letter in which he is furious that the block cutter had not followed his block ready drawing. He did not cut Hokusai noses into the block. He cut Ukiyo-e school noses, which he hates. He says, I hate him, I hate him, I hate him. <laughs> and such was his rage and such was his influence at that particular moment that the publisher actually uh, revised the blocks to give the figures in, in the illustrations hokusai noses rather than ukiyo-e noses. 
Uh, so that's a really interesting example of Huxley interacting directly with the block cutters. And he says in that letter, you know, I looked at such a book and this book and this book, which were cut by my favorite Bach publisher, and I have nothing to fault in it. But then I looked at this and those noses and those eyes were completely wrong. Yeah. That's really interesting. And the reason I was asking is was the, the image of the crane by Bumpo, the, yeah. the book illustrations seem to have more liveliness somehow than the painting but I don't know that's the painting. Painting. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think so. yeah. Uh, I, I, I think you know it, it's really very interesting the way they re reconfigured these things and I was curator for an exhibition here at the University of Leeds some years ago Bumpo's paintings and book illustrations and we were able to put the books and the paintings next to each other and what was fascinating was very often the size of a figure let's say in the painting was exactly the size of the uh, in the book was exactly the size of the figure in the painting but of course there was more sky or trees going above and water in the foreground um and how effective the uh, the book design was in distilling the essence of a particular artist style yeah i think that comes that comes across really well in the in the slides you're showing um, mm -hmm. well that was yeah that was we, we we've we've gone through the questions thank you so much there were a lot of them that's great ellis and um, my pleasure thank you so much for for talking to us that was uh, yeah absolutely absolutely fascinating um a real insight into into you know a, a, a lifetime of scholarship and some really incredible um some really incredible items um so that leads me to say thank you very much and You're welcome. um if you if everyone's in cambridge uh, do come and see the exhibition it's on till the uh, 28th of 28th of may as i say curated um, in house by uh, Kristen williams who is the keeper of the japanese collection has, has done an absolutely wonderful job it's a really a uh, real insight and there's some absolute absolute treasures on display um uh, as well as not just um uh books but also uh some of the scrolls that are in the the university library collection uh, so do do come and see it and keep an eye out on our website for more events um coming up um across the exhibitions run um so that leaves me to say thank you very much and uh thank you very much ellis for coming to talk to us you're welcome my pleasure thank you good night <laughs>